Good evening, and welcome to a curtain call of sorts. This will be Matthew Taylor's last chief executive's event. And in keeping with the collaborative subject matter, this year it's not going to be a lecture, it's going to be a conversation between Matthew and me and all of those who've gathered here today. Uh, I'd urge you to please put questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'll come to them when the time comes. I'll take in as many as I possibly can. I'm so, absolutely sure I won't get to all of them, but I'm also sure they'll contribute to a wonderful conversation. Over the course of his 15 years at the RSA, Matthew told me he's encountered a lot of ideas and frameworks. Many of these attract a glimmer of light, but then they get forgotten. But a few, a very rare few, have really captured his imagination and they keep throwing light on hard problems. His most recent blogs have focused on one of these, what he calls coordination theory. And so what we're going to do this evening is we're going to kick off by talking about this central idea. And to set it up, we're going to use one of the RSA's most impactful, influential innovations ever also one much imitated, it must be said, and one which Matthew supported and was there at the very beginning of the RSA animation. So let's go. Over the years, I've started to notice something interesting. It turns out that several well-established theories in the social sciences, from psychology, sociology and anthropology to organizational studies, political science and policy making, well, they share similar ways of thinking about basic human needs and social forces. In essence, these approaches identify core aspects of what motivates us. And these motivations are then reflected in the ways we go about organisational and social change, and even in our political attitudes. But perhaps more than anything, these core motivations underlie the way we act together and the way we think about acting together. So for that reason, I call them forms of coordination. The first of these forms is based on authority. It's essentially about doing what we're told to do, and it's connected to ideas such as leadership, hierarchy, strategy, expertise. The second is based on values and belonging, doing what we think we ought to do, given the kind of person we think we are. And it's linked to ideas like solidarity, social responsibility, the collective, the tribe, and then finally, there's the form based on who we are as unique individuals, doing what we want to do for ourselves, connected to ideas like autonomy, freedom, entrepreneurship, ambition, creativity. Now, many theories, for example, self-determination theory from psychology or the competing values framework from organizational studies or the idea of public value in policymaking well, they broadly recognize the need to balance and channel these different motivations and the views and methods of change that flow from them. But there are two things which tend too often to be left out. First, that achieving and sustaining balance between those motivations and the forms of change that come with them, it's inherently difficult. This is partly because each of the forms of coordination has aspects which are compatible with the other forms, but also less benign expressions which are not. So, individualism, for example, can be about autonomy, self-expression, creativity, but it could also be about selfishness, atomism, mindless competition. And difficulty also arises because the forms often compete as accounts of why we have social problems and how we have to solve those problems. Indeed, each form gains some of its legitimacy from its critique of the others. So, for example, the advocates of value-based collectivist solutions right now, will often bolster their case by questioning hierarchical control 
or the irresponsibility of individualism. And finally, um, yeah. even when societies or organizations do achieve some kind of balance of ways of acting and thinking, well, the problem is we live in a changing world and change is likely to upset that balance. There's also something else that often gets missed out, and that's the importance of a fourth, rather different perspective, fatalism. Fatalism is an inherent part of the human condition, probably linked to our awareness of our own mortality. But it's also often simply the most accurate assessment of how likely positive change is to occur in any given social context. Now, given how often versions of this framework, combining ideas of authority, of values and belonging, and of individual aspiration, given how often this framework emerges from conceptual and empirical inquiry across a range of disciplines, well, there's a big question. Why is it not more widely accepted, understood and applied? I think one answer is that social science disciplines tend to offer very different accounts of human nature and of society, reflecting their traditions and ideological predispositions. Sociologists are generally more left-wing than economists. Is right. I do think so. Social psychologists focus on individual motivation, Anthropologists think the group is what matters. And these different academic worldviews may also be a reason why the natural sciences, which agree about much more, have been able to advance and win so much more public trust than the social sciences. Now, what I call coordination theory, and the theories that are similar to it, well, they don't offer a slam-dunk way of reaching an agreed diagnosis about social or organisational problems, they don't provide a single prescription about how to achieve progress. But what they do offer, I think, is a, well, it's a kind of shared base camp for social scientists to develop richer accounts of the social worlds we all live in, bringing together the insights offered by different disciplines in a way that makes them more accessible and more useful to a much wider public. Let's face it. We can't afford not to bring the best understanding of who we are as humans to the increasingly complex challenges facing pretty much every community, organization and nation in the world today. If social science, with its inherent commitment to human welfare, is not to be entirely sidelined by the juggernaut of science and technology, well, its proponents need to start emphasising what they do agree about more often than what they don't. After all, if we could agree a bit more about what makes people and what makes societies tick, we might be more able to build a bridge to the future. So that's given everybody quite enough to think about, I would say, certainly judging by the questions that have already been entered. So this notion of a connection theory, Matthew, what do you think it is that keeps bringing you back to it, that won't let you go? It's not that I haven't tried, Margaret. And, and before I start, let me just say thank you to the cognitive media team, to Andrew Parks, who started the whole Animate thing and I think worked on th this one. He's an absolute genius and it's a huge honour for him to have done two for me. He did the one, I, my lecture in 2010 on 21st Century Enlightenment. And I have in my hall a copy of the final shot from that. And I've made absolutely clear to people at the RSA, there's only one thing I want as a leaving gift and that's the final shot of that Minimate. So Andrew's a genius and thank you so much, Andrew, for doing that. There's a bottle of wine winging its way to you. Um, and thank you to the events team for organizing it as well. And also Margaret, thank you so much for, 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 for sharing this. So that's my Oscar speech kind of done. But, um, you know, it's not that I haven't tried, Margaret. You know, I, I, I've, I've, I, I first heard about this theory I can tell you exactly when. It sounds like I'm name dropping, but it's just part of my, I, I just remember it so clearly. So David Miliband, when he was foreign secretary, he called um, people from various think tanks together 
uh, he would do this from time to time. And we would come in and kind of he'd say, well, what's going on in the world kind of thing in the way that politicians do. And um, Jeff Mulgan, who's a, kind of a bit of a hero of mine, um, and our kind of paths are crossed in various ways. And Jeff talked about uh, the work of Mary Douglas and what, what is called cultural theory. And of all the kind of different iterations that are similar to mine, cultural theory is by far the closest for reasons I might go into, but it's, it's, more, it's more dynamic. Uh, I just think it's, it's, and it's the only one that contains fatalism, by the way. So I was immediately interested and this is, you know, this is 11 years ago, I guess, or, or more. I was completely, you know, it's immediately interested more. And, and, and then I started talking about it and writing about it. And people would take the mickey out of me. You know, my friends would kind of tease me about the fact that I ev saw everything through this lens. And so I have tried to give it up because I know that it makes me boring and sound obsessive. But th the reason I come back to it, Margaret, is because it just keeps kind of giving. And, and in two ways. First of all, because... I keep finding it a useful way of understanding situations that I'm in. You know, I've, I've got a new job. I'm starting my job in a couple of weeks and I find it useful to think about the organization I'm going to lead and, and its balance of authority and values and individual kind of aspiration and creativity. I, I look at it and it helps me to kind of think, what kind of organization is it and what might I want to try to, to slightly kind of it, it change in terms of the balance of it. So, it, it continues to be useful to me, but also even though the basic theory is very simple, this idea that we have three active drives, we do what we're told, we do what we think we ought to, we do what we want, and also sometimes we don't do anything at all. There's a lot of richness that comes from it because it's a dynamic theory and all sorts of really interesting propositions drop out of it. I just wish that there was a research community that could test those propositions so that they don't remain merely propositions. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, one of the things that I think is very appealing about it is that unlike some of the authors whose books we saw piled up in the animation, it is that you aren't arguing that we are just one thing. Right. And it seems to me that, you know, in an age of extremism, you know, we've had an awful lot of worrying arguments about people are only selfish, you know, or people are purely altruistic. And that actually this specifically, this kind of, and I have to say, I think it's driven by this thought, this kind of branding of people in this very simple way. None of it's ever going to be adequate because actually human beings are different things in different contexts, who we are, how we behave is hugely contextually driven. And, and, I, and this idea that we are just, we are overwhelmingly one thing seems to me at its heart to be kind of authoritarian in its denial of other influences and effects. Would you agree? Yeah, it's reductive. And, and, and this, I think, is one of the things that, that, again, has made me want over the years to give up on this theory, because I know that at first flush, it seems very reductive. But I hope as we get into the conversation, I hope we explore some of the ways in which I think it, it isn't and it's very rich and generates, I mean, you know, matter comprises very simple elements and uh, yet creates, you know, the world around us and the uh, and the mystery of, of everything. So the fact that something is made of simple, of, of, of basic ingredients doesn't mean that it can't generate enormous diversity and complexity and richness. But yes, I agree, Margaret, but I, I, I and I, I think, I, I want in my, I'm a social scientist, you know, I'm a person, I'm a, I'm quite a tribal person, you know, there are, you know, I'm committed to my awful football team, but I'm also kind of committed to social science. I, I've spent my life reading it and talking about it and consuming it. And I want to make a distinction between social scientists who are at work doing practical work, you know, in government departments and in a whole variety of consultancies and stuff. But at the academic level, at the conceptual level, mm. you know, I, I find it, I mean, we all know, don't we? I don't need to repeat this because a lot's been written about it, that economics, far too much of the economics profession went into a kind of blind alley of the notion of homo economicus, uh, the neoclassical model, and a kind of completely mythical idea of what motivates human beings, of how the world works, of how markets work, with terrible consequences, it has to be said. You know, not just consequences for, for people going to university and learning such a narrow uh, range of ideas but for wider society because it was taken up lock stock and barrel in kind of neoliberal thinking 
But, you know, even though I'm progressive, I have to admit, and this will make me unpopular, I, I'm, I find sociology, a lot of sociology, wearing because it's a kind of, I would describe it as a game of where's the oppressor? That the only way you can understand society, it's a kind of Foucauldian notion, kind of Marx Foucauldian notion, that the only way to understand society is through power. And somebody is oppressing somebody else. And we can understand that's through uh, in race or gender or sexuality or whatever. Now, I'm not denying absolutely the importance of, uh, of class or race or, or, or a prejudice of discrimination or any of these things. But I am saying that to only believe that society can be viewed through that lens and indeed to suggest that not viewing society through the lens of power relations in you know, entirely means you've really got nothing to say. And then, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm going to, I know I'll be annoying a lot of people as I go through this list, but, you know, psychologists far too often tend to just treat human beings as if they're kind of brains inside, you know, brains inside bodies. And all we need to do is to find out how individual brains respond to the world. And when we know how individual brains respond to the world, then that solves it. And I, that's just not, I don't think how humanity is. I think we're, in, we're part of a collective. We're part of a culture, the way in which our brain, and that's why, you know, psychology has this huge problem of replication because they're constantly, psychologists, social psychologists, are constantly creating entirely false contexts in which a group of students in a university in America is subjected to something. And then they say, oh, look, this demonstrates that, you know, if you eat a jam donut, you're more able to do a mass puzzle. Well, it turns out, yes, you are, if you are in a laboratory and you're an American student in a particular day, but actually the second you add any other complexity into it, we'll know that it disappears. So, you know, all these disciplines... I've got so much and I love reading psychology and economics and sociology, but they've through the academy, they've narrowed themselves terribly in my yeah. view. And uh, I, I want to say to them, look, look out beyond this. When I started, I'm old enough, Margaret, that when I started at university, there were sociologists who believed in functionalism, you know, from the kind of Durkheim tradition, people like talk at Parsons, they, they were interested in how society worked and progressed, not just what was wrong with it, pathological about it. And economists remembered crisis. They knew that markets failed. They understood political economy. And then something happened in the 70s. And, you know, we have never really got back at the kind of conceptual level. And I think that what that means is for the public, they listen to a lot of this stuff. They listen to economists describing the people as perfectly informed utility maximizers and think, well, that's not me. And they listen to sociologists and they think, well, you know, the society can only be understood through systems of oppression. And they think, well, you know, not really. And, and that includes people who are supposed to be oppressed, say, well, yeah, okay, that's part of my existence, not all of my existence. And they hear about psychology research, which seems completely abstract and, and unrelated to real life. And they kind of give up on it. And they think instead, I'll listen to scientists because they seem to know what they're talking about. And of course, physicists and chemists and biologists look at different things, but they don't really disagree about what an atom is. They don't really disagree about you know photosynthesis. They don't really disagree about the periodic table. They have a kind of baseline that they work from and social science doesn't have that. Right. So that might beg the question as to whether or not it actually is, can be, or should be considered a science. Maybe it shouldn't. Maybe it's one of the humanities. Yeah, well... So I why does everybody now want to be a scientist? Yeah. A theory for everything. <laughs> I, I mean, look, there is an empirical foundation to uh, the social scientists, and there should be an empirical foundation. And those social scientists who are kind of at work doing practical work, you know, they are much, much more empirical. And, and, and I think it, it's important that, 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 that we you know, use the data and that we are, use experiments. And, 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 and part of what I want to do in constantly talking about this theory is, is that it seems to me it generates testable Propositions not testable in the way that science is able to test things. I don't think not as clear cut as that. But but propositions which we could then look at different societies and different organisations and say, okay, does it does it look as though this? Is, uh, let me give you one example, Margaret, if I may. So, um, th the theory suggests that the best way to do things, broadly speaking, the best way to achieve change with human beings is if we can combine those drives. So. It, that's pretty obvious, isn't it, Margaret? You advise organisations, and, and I'm sure that you, you'll bear this out. That an organisation which is able to align 
what people do because of what the leaders say they should do and managers say they should do, what they want to do because of their values, their social values, but also they're just their, 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 their bonds with their fellow team members, but also what they want to do for themselves, their own desire for growth and development and success. If you can get all of that together, you've got a dynamic organization, what Charlie Ledbetter once called a creative community with a cause. So that, that's, that's good. Now, I identify this fourth thing, fatalism, which, which is the subject of my blog this week and fascinates me. Um, partly because we talk about it so little. Now, I, I want to suggest that, th- that there are two types of fatalism. There's a fatalism which is to do with knowing the human condition, and we all know we're going to die. There's a kind of fatalism which is just part of what it is to be a human being. But there's another type of fatalism, and that fatalism is situational. It's based on our assessment of how likely change is to happen in a particular context. Now, in my blogs, I wrote about monocultures. So I wrote about organizational forms, so social situations where one of those forces is completely dominant. Uh, and so I gave the example of totalitarian regimes as being entirely authoritarian. It's all to do with authority. It's very little, people aren't really motivated by belonging. They're not really given much freedom. It's all about following orders. And my prediction is if you're in a culture which is monocultural, where it feels that only one part of you can be expressed, you can't bring those forces together, then fatalism will be quite strong. That's my proposition. And I found it interesting. So I'll give an an obvious example and then one that I thought was kind of really fascinating. So the obvious one is in the Soviet empire, for example, uh, in Eastern Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a lot of fatalism. Humor and other things were all about the kind of intractability of day-to-day life, you know? So in a society where all that really holds it together is the rules, people, you know, people are fatalistic, you know? I thought another interesting example though, Margaret, which you'll know more about than me, is, is the banks before the credit crunch. Now you might think, well, these are not fatalistic. These are ultra-individualistic environments, very little authority. The leaders didn't know what was going on most of the time and very little sense of kind of social responsibility or teamwork, highly individualistic. So you might say, well, there's no, there was no fatalism there. These were really dynamic, but actually there was because when you read the stuff, a lot of these people knew this was all gonna go wrong. They knew it wasn't right. These were people who went back to their families at the weekend knowing that they were doing stuff that was really kind of quite problematic, that they were benefiting from other people's misery, that they were selling risk in an unreasonable way, or that they just didn't even really know what was happening. Mm. And they had to somehow live their lives with that knowledge. And I think that is a form of fatalism. That's a form of kind of giving up on being a human being. So there's a proposition. The proposition is in monocultures where there's just one form of human motivation being motivate, being expressed, there will also be the existence of quite a lot of high levels of fatalism. Now, I think that's something you could kind of test in various ways. Not, as I say, like you can test something in a laboratory, but you could test it. You could look at situations and say, is that true? So, yeah, I, I think social science should aspire to be a science, but it's its own type of science. You're right about that, Margaret. It shouldn't try to be that. Uh, it shouldn't try to have the same kind of criteria as natural science. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, as you're talking, I'm reminded of a conversation I once had with the economist Robert Schiller, and he described to me how, I think in the 70s, going back to what you say, sociology and psychology and economics all inhabited the same building. And then as they got bigger and endowments made it all richer and so on, they all separated out into their own empires. And then, of course, they started to fight with each other for dominance, you know. And, um, and it just strikes me that part of what you're talking about is this kind of atomized, isolated, siloed perspective, which I think I hear you say, you know, flies in the face of the complex reality, which is I am a, there are different drivers for me in different contexts and in different moments of history where I may be fatalistic, but actually still quite motivated because I have some choice over how bad is it really going to be, right? So um, so in many ways, it seems to me that part of what you're talking about is increasing and competitive specializations, yeah. right? A, a sort of everybody's fighting for their theory. Um, and as a consequence, nobody's learning from each other. So... So this could all be very theoretical, except, of course, you're not just looking at it theoretically, right? You've been running a big, complex, important organization for 15 years. So my curiosity is, 
this way of seeing the world, how do you think it's actually helped you run the RSA for what has been, you know, a pretty momentive, a momentous period of time? I mean, one of one of your team was saying how, you know, when you joined, YouTube had only just launched, you know, so that which feels like, you know, ancient history. So I suspect this idea hasn't let go of you because you actually seeing it you've been seeing it play out around you all the time. So theories are good theories if they're helpful. How has this one helped you? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great a great question. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons that I like the theory is that I think it's reasonably intuitive. Um, now, that can be a criticism because people can say, well, it's bloody obvious. Well, <laughs> it, it, it may be obvious, but if it's obvious, why aren't we recognize why don't we recognize it more and use it more i think it is quite intuitive and so i think in a way the reason that the theory attracted it, it, it itself to me was that that is the way that i try to think about how to run organizations and you know it's interesting to me if you look at surveys of staff the ones that are the most well established you know investors are the investors in people or best companies or whatever if you look at the criteria they use which they've developed over many many years they are asking questions in these three domains. They're asking, do you trust, do you value your leaders and your managers and the strategy of the organization? Do you feel you're part of a team? Do you feel that what you do is of value? And do you feel that you are growing and that you're respected and that you're treated fairly and all of that? So I think that that phrase that I used earlier, that, that Charlie led me to use, because so Charlie, this is many, many years ago, looked at a whole variety of the most innovative organizations in the world. And he came up with this wonderful phrase. He, you know, I don't think he used my framework at all, even Murray Douglas's framework. He, this was his just his, his kind of response to what he saw was he said they are, these organizations are creative communities with the cause. And I think that I have always tried to be aware of the fact that, that, that if you try to lead too much in a particular way, it will be counterproductive. Um, and this is what the theory argues. You know, if you try, if you say, well, there's a problem in an organization, let's exert more authority. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you will tend to do is you will turn any kind of sort of belonging sense against you because what people will have in common is that they're pissed off with the authoritarian manager they've got. Um, or it will turn individualism <laughs> and creative and great for the organization into being subversive in various ways. So I think as a leader, the thing that I most believe after all these years and you know, lots of failure and lots of mistakes and you know, goodness knows, is that what leaders have to do is, is understand dilemmas, to understand trade-offs, to understand that organizations are fragile balances of different forces and that when you try to generate change you need to do it in a way which 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 recognizes the system as a whole doesn't simply try to crank something up doesn't simply try to say well let's pull that lever down really quickly if you do you won't have great consequences and i wrote in one of my recent blogs about new public management you know mm. uh, new public management was was the attempt to drive individualistic thinking markets, performance-related pay, competition into public services. So the view was public services are good at belonging and they're good at authority. My goodness, there's a lot of rules. Mm. They're not great at kind of risk-taking entrepreneurialism. So let's drive these commercial ways of doing things in. Now, I'm not utterly opposed to that idea. The problem was when you do that, it has consequences and nobody really thought through the consequences. So politicians said, well, we want markets and we want competition and we want this. But we still want to control everything. Well, you know, that's not going to work. And it hasn't worked. And new public management has been a terrible, very expensive and disruptive washout because of that. So I think the way it's helped me, Margaret, has been this sense that, which I guess is system thinking in a way, mm -hmm. is that what you're trying to do with an organization is, is, is understand it as a system to recognize that it needs interventions at certain times. Not always the same intervention, not always a hierarchical intervention. Sometimes you need to just say, actually, as an organization, we've lost our sense of values. Let's give ourselves a bit of time and a bit of space to rediscover each other. And sometimes you just have to let go and say, we've got to let individuals have more space and we'll let things rip. Yeah. And that, that process of, of adjustment, everything I've got wrong at the RSA, and there's been a lot, and this is maybe just because I'm getting old, but everything I've got wrong is because I've tried to do things too quickly. I've tried to do things too brutally. I've tried to make force change rather than creating the circumstances yeah. in which it can happen. And I think 
that's what this theory does. And the other thing, going back to the, the, the first point you made, Margaret, is the other reason I love this theory, is, as you implied, is that a lot of theory feels very abstract, but all of these things are, are in all of us. You know, when I'm at work as the boss, I am tend towards being hierarchical. People have to tell me it's not all about top-down solutions. You know, when I was in central government, I tended to think it was about top-down solutions. When I'm, you know, miserably sitting at West Bromwich Albion, you know, suffering, I'm. it's all about my feeling of belonging. We're all in it together. You know, when I'm delivering at the food bank on Friday, that's all about that bit of me. And then when I'm running Park Run, and isn't it great when Park Run starts again in a few weeks, I am going to be the fastest veteran. And if you get in my way, my goodness, I'm pushing past you. So, and also a lot of the time, and by the way, this is also true of West Bromwich Albion fatalism. A lot of the time, I don't do anything at all. I just moan at the TV or, you know, wish things were different. So these things are all in us. Now, people are different. Some people are more individualistic. Some people are more solidaristic. Some pe- but all of it is in all of us. And I think that's really valuable because it, isn't it great to have a theory about society, which you can kind of recognize when you look in the bathroom mirror? Yeah. yeah. We have a wonderful question here from Mark Dodds, which is saying in the context of your theory, what it, where is the human base camp that you talk about? You know, you talk about building the future from there. How do you define that? What is the base camp of this theory? So it would be, and uh, thanks, Mark, for the question. You know, one of the things I'm going to miss most about the RSA, well, I, the staff are brilliant as well, but the fellows, and I've known Mark for years, and um, if it's the same Mark as I think it is, uh, he's been campaigning brilliantly for pubs which are run collect, you know, run collectively and where people aren't exploited and that pubs that really serve their communities. And he's he's been through enormous amounts trying to make that happen. Mark, I'm still with you. I hope it still hope it happens. Um uh, I think it's what we said earlier, Margaret. You know, for me, the base camp is 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 to encourage social scientists to step out of the kind of path dependency they've got of their tradition, of the silos, of their political predispositions, and instead say, look, what what can we try to agree about? And 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 let's just look at actually what human beings themselves kind of do and feel, and let's start from there. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's the base camp is a different a different attitude. And you know, I'm not suggesting it's I'm not suggesting it's easy. The academy is, you know, a very competitive place and you get rewarded as an academic for being narrow and for sticking to the, the conventions of your discipline. Multidisciplinarity is not easy. It's not easy intellectually, but it's not easy in career terms either. So, you know, for me, the base camp is that we would say, look actually this narrowness is really problematic for us. And actually, if we want the public to appreciate social science, not just empirical social science, which they do because it's so important and epidemiology and things like that, you know, we, we really relied actually on social scientists, not just natural scientists over the last year. But if we want them also to be interested in the big ideas as well as the empirical work, then we're gonna have to work on it together because otherwise they're gonna continue to feel we're much more interested in our, our academic peers than communicating with the public. Right, right. I mean, it's quite interesting, you know, this this speaks to me quite pragmatically in the sense that I've just kicked off at the University of Bath, where I now teach, um, the first vertically integrated project in England. (laughs) Tell me about about it. So VIPs have just been invented, right? Vertically integrated projects are where you put lots of students from different disciplines together to do a project in the real world. Now, I'm kind of flabbergasted that these have been going on in Scotland and Wales for a while, but apparently they're a whole new thing in academia. Um, And strangely enough, ours just happens to be the first. And I didn't even know they existed. But, you know, I'm so struck because I think, well, but they should exist. They should have existed, you know, decades ago, because exactly to your point, you know, this is where students from engineering and architecture and sociology and so on can meet together, work together, and actually to contribute to each other's thinking. Um, but as you say, you know, the academic environment is not set up to evaluate value, grade, mark, reward, this kind of work, even though it's probably the most pragmatic. It's funny, Margaret, I, I, because it's my last chief executive lecture, I'm allowed to be self-indulgent, which is why it's, by the way, I'm occasionally sipping a glass of wine and I make no apologies for it. Um, 
It's it's funny that you say that because I'm just going to reminisce for a minute. When I was at university at Southampton, I did a sociology degree and we did a project uh, which was a group of engineers and a group of sociologists looking at the modernization of signal boxes. So it was a great project. And uh, we looked at one of the really old signal boxes. There were still a few then of, you know, do you remember the kind of guy, it was nearly always a guy, I think, with his kind of, his kettle and his, you know, yeah. blanket and stuff in his box on his own. And then we looked at the kind of medium medium one, which was switches. And uh, um, and then the, the, they just, I think, built a really big one with no windows. It was all, you know, computerized uh, uh, by Waterloo Station. And we, the engineers looked at the technology, but we as sociologists looked at what this meant about work process and, and things like that. And maybe my kind of enthusiasm for multidisciplinarity comes from that um, as well. And, and also I remember... You know, I, I think the reason I got a reasonably good degree in the end was because on the day of, we weren't allowed to do continuous assessment, right? It all had to be the exam. So we'd all written the chapter for this this little book about, yeah. about Signalman. And I was told, just re rewrite the chapter in the exam room. And for some reason, the day of the exam, I thought that's not good enough. I, I'm so boring. And I, I remember walking around Southampton and developing what I thought Marx would say about the modernization of signal boxes, what I thought Durkheim would say about the modernization of signal boxes, and what I thought Weber would say. About. And in my essay, rather than just recanting my description of visiting signal boxes, I kind of did a theoretical account of what I thought these three fathers of sociology would say. And my tutor said to me a few weeks later when I graduated, he said, you know, it was that that got you the good degree because we were so amazed that you'd bothered to think about it. So I guess... The point is, partly what you've got there is Margaret, Margaret is multidisciplinary, but partly it is, I love it when big concepts feel useful to real things. We have this separation of big concepts and practicality, but actually, you know, Weber's idea, one of Weber's ideas has probably been the idea I have used more often than any other idea in practical ways. So Weber said that there is a distinction in organisations between substantive and formal rationality. So substantive rationality is about end goals what you're trying to achieve. Procedural rationality is about rules. And he said it is a tendency of all organizations for procedural rationality to push out substantive rationality. That is in the nature of bureaucracy. Right. And so what all right. bureaucracies and organizations have to do is continuously, you'll never do it forever. You, it's just a habit. You have to continuously reassert the substantive rationality in the face of the tendency for organizations to get clogged up by the rationality of rules. Now that's a big conceptual idea of unbelievable usefulness. The number of times in, in my own organizations or organizations I've given advice to, I've said, look, hang on, hang on. Let's try to get back to what we're really trying to achieve here. And let's try to remember the rules here are there to serve the final purpose, the ultimate purpose. Mm -hmm. So how would your theory help organizations, for example, that are thinking through um, you know, so thorny question that nobody ever seems to find the answer to. Thinking through the issues around diversity, right? We've lived through, we're still living through Black Lives Matter. My, my whole professional career, we've been talking about women in the workplace as though it's still a new thing. So, so this is a really thorny, very multifaceted problem. Um, I often get the feeling it's thrown to HR because um, nobody else wants to own it, right? It's messy and it's human and so on, but there's an understanding that it impacts productivity and legitimacy and innovation and so on. So if I'm sitting atop of an organization and everybody's saying to me, we need to improve diversity, we need, we've been working at this for years, we've got absolutely nowhere. And somebody says, well, you know, what you should do is think about Matthew's you know, connection theory. How does that help me? Wow, what a great question. Um, and if I can't answer this, then everything just falls apart, doesn't it? It just shows that I'm, I'm, I've got, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm an emperor's new clothes moment, isn't it? This. Well, well, to be fair, I think if you can't answer it in twenty minutes, everybody would really cut you some slack. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it quickly. Um, the, the the approach that I would take. So this is the approach I would take, rather than any conclusions I would draw, because we don't know what organisation we're talking about. Is I'd say, look, if we want this organization to be truly inclusive and diverse and great as a consequence of that, we need 
that to be something which is reinforced by authority. We need it to be something which come, the rules need to align with that. It needs to feel that the processes within this organization, how you get promoted or what counts as acceptable behavior, or unacceptable behavior, that would need to speak to this. And if it didn't, if we were saying we believed in all this stuff, but the only way to get on, the only way the leaders ever paid attention was something felt like it pulled away from that, that actually, in order to be successful in the organization, you had to be a man, even though there was a kind of commitment to gender equality. So first of all, the kind of rules, the regulations, the authority needs to go to that. Secondly, there has to be a real a sense within the organization that what you're talking about is fair and reasonable. And that means you have to put real time into it. And I think that, you know, the best work on diversity and extra inclusion does allow all voices to come forward and take time in order to say this is something that everybody has got to feel yeah. committed to. And and let's if people are not, if people are unsure, if people think it's excessive or whatever, let's that's fine. This is a no blame situation. Let's let's have that conversation. We can all and this will strengthen us as a team. And then finally, it should align with people's own incentives. You know, if you do something which forces people to do things day in, day out, which they don't want to do, which go against their sense of, 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 of themselves, then it's not going to work. It will just fall apart. It'll just fall away because, you know, we are all day to day incentivized to do what we what is what is right for us. So first of all, I'd say that's the way to look at it. And then secondly, I'd say, and you have to keep all of these things in balance as well. Mm -hmm. If your diversity, equity and inclusion strategy is all relying on the imposition of rules from the top, well, it might achieve something, but it isn't going to achieve a joyful workplace because people will be ticking boxes, right? If your diversity, equity and inclusion strategy is just about values mm -hmm. and just about a kind of purist view of total equality, it, 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 it might be inspirational, but it probably won't be that practical and you might find that the expectations that you've raised about the possibility that you can be an enclave of pure inclusion and equality in a world that is unequal, you probably find you what find it hard to live up to that. That's a bit like I was writing in my blog about communes, why communes don't last is partly because they can't live up to the ideals they've got. And if you only incentivize people kind of individually, if you just kind of get people to do this because it's in their own interest, then people will game it. You know, they will, they, they, you know, that's, that's, we've seen that. So use all of those things, but also try to keep them in a kind of healthy balance. And, and that way, not only do I think you will encourage greater diversity and equity and inclusion, but you'll do it in a way that people in the organization enjoy and are part of and feel good about rather than something which they feel they ought to, as it were, do. Now, I haven't mentioned fatalism, and I, I would say even a bit of fatalism, which is to say organizations should do the very best they can, but no organization can be perfect. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's don't try to don't don't try to believe that you yourself in your organization alone can change what is going on in the world. You need to do the best that you can, but you need to be realistic about what it is that you can achieve. And sometimes we set enormously ambitious goals, which we're never going to reach. And that leads to disillusionment. Better to set something that is practical that we can reach and then set something else that's practical that we can reach. Yeah. I mean, I think what you say there too, that's very, you know, feels very real is this is going to take time. And it isn't a straight line from where we are to where we want to be. You know, it's going to be a rather scraggly line that may double back on itself from time to time. And if you incorporate elements of fatalism, there are going to be places where we get it wrong and we have to then repair the damage we've done. Absolutely. So there's a kind of recognition that we're going to do our best and, and nobody's going to be perfect here. And yeah, that not, not, seems to be yeah. absolutely absent from the kind of political or business playbook, you know, the recognition that when you're trying to do something that's never been done before, mistakes are going to happen. Yeah, because there's a new, look, absolutely, Margaret, because there's, th this is the other thing that's really important to me about this theory is the dynamism within it. That, that what it recognizes is that these ways of thinking set each other off in yeah. ways that are quite unpredictable. And I, I, yeah. I give an example I've given before, but I, I, I love this. Years and years ago, I was waiting outside. Uh, I, I was at Vauxhall Station, uh, underground station. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting to go in. It was raining. And there was some problem with the Victoria line. So we were queuing up in a walkway. 
Now, I would say this Q, uh, its characteristics was that it was a combination of being hierarchical and fatalistic. We were queuing up because we were told to, because they were the rules, and we were queuing up because, you know, the bloody tube had broken down and what we're going to do, right? Now, we were queuing up in this kind of a, this passageway where on the, what, the left-hand side where we were was the queue in. There was on the right-hand side was the, was the, was the passageway out. And there was a, a, a metal railing uh, kind of waist high all the way along. Now, something happened. Some people, uh, the queue was moving very slowly, started to duck under the bar and walk quickly up the exit. Now, they may have done it because they had a, a, a job interview, a life emergency, or maybe they were just selfish bastards. I don't know. But what was interesting was, this is a, this, so this is a show of what might be described as pathological individualism. People going, I'm going to have what I want and sod the rest. What happened in the queue was that we slightly changed. You could hear the murmurs. We stopped just being a hierarchical queue and we started to be a values and belonging queue because we were now a queue of people who chose to queue. We believed in the moral, you know, we were morally better than this display of individualism. And I, I, I just found that fascinating. And that happens a lot in organizations is that you get these feedback mechanisms and overreach of authority leads to a feedback. You create an individualistic system of kind of, you know, payment by results and everyone gets sort of very motivated by it. And it, it, it disrupts authority, it undermines. So the fatalism in a way is just recognizing that, that things are continuously in flux. And as, as was said in the Minimate, even when you've got a good balance, even when you feel you're running a creative community with the cause, yeah. stuff happens. Stuff happens in the environment. You know, the, the, the economy goes boom, COVID happens or whatever, and things change again. And you're going to have to, and as a leader, you know, as, as Henry Mintzberger said, you know, leadership, I, I, you know, his metaphor, Margaret, I think, was, was he said the best way to describe strategy was watching his wife making a clay pot. She had an ultimate idea of what she wanted to achieve, an aesthetic. She started to turn the wheel, and then it was just a matter of continuous adjustment. Yeah. And, continuous yeah. and that, for me, is strategizing. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, the, look, project management, Gantt charts, all that's very important. I'm not putting, but, but real strategizing at that level is, is that process of continuous adjustment. Exactly. And, and you have to do that because we're in a world where the things that motivate us come into conflict, you know, continuously in our heads, in our organizations, in our societies. Exactly. There's a really nice uh, question here from Matthew Traherne, which is, um, and I, it connects to the fact that, of course, you know, the RSA is the Royal Society for the Arts as well as other things. He says, how might culture or the arts understood broadly play a role here? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So I think within my kind of broad schema, I would say that, the, the arts are primarily a kind of values and belonging space. That isn't to say that art is art, it's often very individualistic, but it's the place where we express our sense of belonging. Part of the thing that art does for us is it, 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 it creates those kind of bonds, that kind of sense of being part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think that that is a really, you know, it's, that's one of the reasons it's a balm to us in our very individualistic our culture. Right. Our culture can, I mean, I, I, my broader account is, I think, as a society, we're suffering from a solidarity deficit as a consequence of changes in the modern world, but also the impact of neoliberal kind of policy and thinking. Right. And, and that's why I think that we've seen the rise of populism, because the rise of populism is about feeding our solidaristic needs, our tribalism. And I think arts and culture offer a much more benign way of feeding mm -hmm. that. But I also think arts and culture are good at fatalism. I think that we, we're not great, Margaret, are we, at at living with fatalism in, in modern societies. You know, if you are doing your CV, you know, you'll put, you know, I'm a dynamic, go-getting, risk-taking, blah, blah, blah. You won't put, I'm very realistic, you know. Uh, and sometimes I think it's not gonna, you know, I, 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 that's not, you know, that's not our kind of way of, you know, we're not bad as, as bad as the Americans, but pretty much, you know, we, 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 we look down on fatalism. Yeah. And religion used to play a really important part because religion was a place you could take your fatalism because religion could say you're very, very small and you're going to die, but it's OK. You know, and the decline of religion has left us not knowing what to do with this. And a book that I quote an awful lot is Ernest Becker's book, um, which is uh, um, about how our awareness of our own mortality can lead to kind of mania and yeah. our mortality is harder to cope with in the absence of God. And the other thing, therefore, that I think a long answer, sorry, but the other thing, Matthew, that I think arts and culture does is it can be a way of, it can be a place where we can confront fatalism. 
in amazing music and wonderful literature and poetry, mm. it can speak to the pathos of human existence in a way that we find tolerable and even inspiring. Uh, and that's one of the things that that's one of the incredible powers that, that it has. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because I take it can also speak to the meaning of life, not yeah. just the fatalism of it. But it, I mean, I think because of all the conversations I've had with people during lockdown, you know, what they have missed is the sense they get when they hear a live piece of music or they see a painting, as it were, in the flesh, a absolutely visceral sense of being alive and that being alive matters in a way that's quite inchoate. It's not utilitarian. It's not I'm being alive matters because it's just I am alive and this feels fantastic and something has just happened to me that um, makes me feel actually quite connected to life in general. So, yeah. And I think it has that capacity and it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I always come back to this, you know, Myra Hess playing Beethoven in the middle of the Blitz, you know, is that it's such an extraordinary sense of we are better than fatal, the fatalism of fascism. We are collective listening to this, but also we are individually being profoundly moved by the emotional truth of it. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that arts and culture are linked to the kind of transcendent. And, you, you know, yeah. I, in the blog I wrote about this, I, I described solidarity, that values and belonging drivers, bringing out the best and the worst of us, because I think it brings out the best of us, that sense of being connected of being part of the collective. It's 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 in a way the thing we want to be motivated by. We don't really want to be motivated by being told what to do and, or just by our, the, the burden of our own individual wants and desires. We feel best when we're being mobilized by the group, when we're in the football crowd or at the, you know, the festival or in the concert hall and we're part of the group, that gives us that feeling of connection and transcendence. And that's a lot of us, we miss a lot of that in our lives. It's such an important part of the lives of people in pre-civilized, you know, pre-historic civilizations, you know, but so much less so in our rationalized world. Mm -hmm. But, and this again goes to the kind of reason why I think the theory is so rich, that same set of feelings bring out the worst of us because that's the same as the basis for tribalism. Right. That's the same as the crowd applauding, applauding Trump when he says, I am your voice. It's that same yearning for belonging right. brings out the best of us, brings out the worst yeah. of us. In the same way that religion can bring out the best of us in charity and it can bring out the best, the worst of us in extremism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. What doesn't your theory make sense of? Oh, lots of things. You know, I mean, I, I really wouldn't want to suggest that, that this is a kind of theory that explains everything and i think that you know it's primarily a theory about what to do in in ongoing situations with where what you're trying to do is working with people so it's about people in 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 kind of organizations countries communities um it's not about what to do in a kind of what necessarily in a kind of one-off situation what's the best way to solve this particular problem although i do argue and i've argued in the blogs that some of the best policies I've seen have been policies which absolutely work because they're well designed by the strategists, because they tap into legitimacy, they tap into what we think is fair, and also they're cleverly designed because they actually get people to do things they want to do rather than force them to do things they don't want to do. But you know, I, no, no theory, you know, no theory captures uh, 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 everything. So um, I, I don't want to claim that it's you know it's not like what well, I don't want the number. What was the number in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It's not. You know, too. 40, it's not 42, no. It, but, but, and, and more than that, you know, it, 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 for me, it's a useful way of starting to think. It's not, it doesn't close anything off. It doesn't say this is what you have to do. It just helps you diagnose what's going wrong and get a sense of the kind of terrains you might want to look for solutions. That, yeah. right. right. So I know you're going on to become chief executive of the NHS Confederation. This is hardly... Um, you know, taking the easy option at a time of incredible change and anxiety and need and hurt and I expect exhaustion. How do you think your theory or the framework of it will help you and your colleagues? It's, it's hard to think of a place really that's less theoretical right now. Yeah, well, I, again, I, I want to say this is not, I would not use it in a kind of, want to use it in a theoretical sense. I, I you know, I, I, I guess 
I will use it partly as a way of thinking about the organization I'm going to lead and the characteristics of that of that organization, and partly as a way of thinking about what that organization would be trying to achieve in relation to our wonderful and fantastic National Health Service. And um, so, you know, one of the things that I bring to that is that is that we have what we what we have seen in the NHS in the last few years has that the kind of new public management that started with Kenneth Clark actually in his reforms mm. with with um, uh, trust hospitals and the internal market and GP fund holding and then carried on with Tony Blair you know, and Simon Stevens was advisor in number 10 into, you know, foundation trusts and the internal market and all of that. that. There's been a big retreat from that because it's not really worked in lots of ways. And we're moving instead. And there's a broad consensus in the health service about this towards integration and a focus on population health. And that's one of the reasons why I was excited to get the job, because there is a consensus. And I, you know, I'm a bit old for battling. I don't really want to have, you know, I will fight the government on behalf of the Confed for more money. And we def the NHS de desperately needs that if it's going to come out, if it's going to deal with the, 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 the enormous kind of overhang of COVID. Um, but I do believe, even though I'm, you know, progressive, I do believe individualism matters. I believe the ideas that come with individualism matter. And so, one of the things I'm interested in is if the health service isn't going to use those techniques, how do we still make sure there's innovation in the health service? How do we make sure that people are incentivized and encouraged to experiment, to take risks? Because the future of the NHS depends upon having the right resources. It depends, depends upon being a really efficient organization. You know, it's a huge, I think it was a country, it would be the 33rd biggest country in the world. So it can continuously just <laughs> work on being as efficient as it can, but also innovation and transformation and digital and technology offers enormous opportunities to do that. And so I think if I bring a bias to it at all, I would say, how do we, without reverting to the, you know, the, the, the kind of problems of, of too much competition and atomism, mm. how do we make sure that we don't lose the, the innovation even a little bit of competition because these are things that motivate us they motivate people and, and there's no problem with them fundamentally as long as they're part of an overall healthy system so you know that's what that's that's what i will kind of that's what i kind of bring to it but you know i've got so much to learn i'm, I'm incredibly you know i'm being unbelievably honored to be the rsa chief executive for 50 years and i'm now incredibly honored to be part of this amazing thing we call the NHS. And if I've got one idea as, as we finish that I will take into the organization, it's that the NHS needs to not be in the mode of, of, of holding out a begging bowl. It needs to be the mode of saying, yeah, it's not just about how can Britain save the NHS, it's about how can the NHS save Britain? That what the NHS stands for, that the values that it stands for, the incredible importance that it plays in every community as an employer, as a, you know, it's, 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 it's substance in every community, the, the growth of the health marketplace around the world where the NHS could be, you know, really important source of dynamism, actually, for our economy as well. I think that one of the stories I want to say is that, you know, it's not NHS, it's not, we're not saying to Britain, you know, you've got to save us. We're saying if the NHS was as strong and as brilliant as it could be and you supported it, it could be part of how this country heals itself and how it succeeds in a kind of post-Brexit world. Wonderful. Matthew, I'm sure this is quite a bittersweet moment for you and for many, many people watching tonight. Um, I'm sure they'd want to thank you for so much of the pioneering work that you've championed at the RSA, although we probably all take it for granted now. You know, it's worth remembering that Matthew was a huge champion of public events like this, chairing and speaking at countless numbers of them over the years and being a part of really what has made this platform and the RSA itself so impactful and so far reaching. So I would like to suggest that people, you know, destroy the network by unmuting for a moment and yeah. applauding Matthew as a way of saying thank you, not just for tonight, but for the many years of really vigorous open debate and exploration of ideas that are shaping, indeed, connecting society today. So could I invite everyone, please, just to say, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, fellows. Thank you. Thanks also, of course, to everyone who's joined in tonight uh, all from all around the world, supporting the work of the RSA. Of one thing we can be very certain, 
there will always be plenty to talk about and plenty more work to do. So with that, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everybody who attended. And good night. Good night. Thank you, Margaret. Bye, everybody.